Hi, I'm Joshua Tan. I'm a Singaporean international student here at the University of Derby. I study a master's in art therapy, and I've got one year left until I'm done. So where are you from? You, you don't sound local. That's, that's usually the first question that I get asked whenever I meet someone new. Uh, I always answer with a bit of a laugh, because to be honest, I've never really sounded local, no matter where I am in the world, no matter how much I've wanted to. You see, I'm what some people might call an adult third culture kid, uh, or TCK for short, and that's usually used to refer to people who have spent a significant amount of time in a culture or community outside that of their parents. So, born in one country, raised in another, and having to form a mix of the two that's uniquely theirs, it's called a third culture. But there are lots of different words for this sort of identity. There's cross-cultural kid, global nomad, but none of it really negates the questions that you get, which the most of which is, where are you from? And so to answer that, like any good TCK, I've got a long answer and I've got a short one. And it really depends on who I'm talking to, how interested they are and how much time they have. So the short answer, the short answer is that I'm from the small, sunny island of Singapore. The long answer, whew, the long answer is that I was born in Singapore, but I'm a missionary's kid. I moved when I was six months old. I spent my childhood growing up in small towns across Southeast Asia, among the dusty roads and green party fields of Thailand. I was sent to an international boarding school for other missionary kids in the lush tropical jungles of Malaysia. Um, and that's where I picked up my strange mishmash of an accent um, from people from all over the world. I spent my teenage years back in Singapore, uh, and I find myself in the UK now that I'm an adult. So one of the reasons why I'm here is to kind of talk about what it was like for me. For the first nine years of my life, I moved on average every six months. Um, and that was between towns, countries, communities. Uh, on one hand, it was great. It's such a privilege to travel, to be able to experience other cultures. It's made me who I am today, um, adaptable, open-minded, curious about other people, which is so important. Um, but there was a dark side as well. Um, I think one of the things it does is that it can be hard to make lasting friendships in a world of goodbyes. It was, it was really hard to, to find a place to call home, to feel like I belonged, truly belonged. And today I just want to share what I wish someone had told me when I was growing up, that to challenge the way that we sometimes see belonging, that it isn't so much just about belonging and not belonging. Maybe there's a space in between, um, a space in between that I call the borderlands of belonging that we're constantly journeying through. So the borderlands of belonging is that, that hazy period when you move between cultures, communities, countries, when you feel like you're on the fringes, part of a place, you're not quite part of it. You know that term, culture shock? Right? It, it's, it's always felt a little bit too harsh to describe that slow, agonizing search to settle and resettle. Um, and here's the thing though, you don't need to be a TCK to have been on the borderlands of belonging. I think we've all been there at some point. Um, maybe you've moved from um, one city to another for university, or you've had to settle in another country for work, or you've dated or married into a different cultural community. I think at some point in time, most of us have been on the borderlands. Most of us have longed to belong. And Today, I want to share a little bit of my own, own journey through those borderlands of belonging. Um, there, there's so many aspects to a TCK story, there's, but uh, today I just want to use a small part of it, and that's my accent, just to illustrate this journey, uh, to help people understand what that's like. I just want you to think right now, can you remember being on the borderlands of belonging? What is one thing you remember? Do you have a memory of what that was like when you realized that you were sort of on the fringes? I, I remember that. I remember entering the borderlands. So, age nine. I wake up in the dark, 5 a.m. in the morning, and I smell this very distinct smell. It's, it's a smell of chicken soup that's gone bad. I really hope you never get to smell that. But um, it's a smell I've come to know very well. It's a distinct smell of fear. It's the first time I'm back in Singapore for good. I've just moved back, but it's so different from anything I've ever known as a nine-year-old kid. And I'm, I'm struggling. I just, I'm struggling, but I don't know 
how to say it. I think we often say that children are resilient, but sometimes it's not so much that they're resilient as they just don't really have the words to describe what's going on for them. And as a nine-year-old, I just didn't have that. But my body knew. My body was going under so much stress that for the next morning and every morning for that first week of school, I'm vomiting because my body is so stressed. It's strange because I'm an Asian TCK back in his home country. Um, I look like everyone else. I should fit in. I've got my, my big school backpack. I've got my standard school uniform. I've got my bad haircut. I look like everyone else. I should be fine. But one thing, one thing makes me stand out the moment I open my mouth, and that's my accent. I have a classmate that comes up to me, um, and he says in Singapore in English, or Singlish, which is the colloquial language that we use there in Singapore, he says, why you speak like newscaster like that? Uh, in English, that means, uh, why do you speak like a newscaster? And then it hits me. For the first time in my life, I realize that I'm different. As a kid, you always assume that everyone else is the same. You don't even recognize differences in that sense. And to this boy, in his mind, I sound like the people who read the news at nine o'clock on television. He's had no other experience with somebody like that. And so begins my own journey through the borderlands for the next one and a half decades. Some people think it's, uh, it's cool that I have an accent. Other people uh, think I'm being posh. They tell me to stop faking it. I get bullied on school buses, down class corridors. And I think the toughest thing sometimes was Singaporean Chinese strangers who would meet me on the street and who would scold me for not knowing my mother tongue of Mandarin. And they would say, you should be ashamed of yourself. I am ashamed. I'm ashamed that I'm not local enough. I'm ashamed that I'm never local enough, no matter where I am in the world, no matter how much I try. And that shame, that shame becomes anger. And anger directed inwards becomes a teenager's struggle with depression and anxiety. I withdraw inside myself, but like any good TCK, on the outside, I look fine. So my teachers would write in my report book, quiet, but thoughtful. I think every person would understand when I say that when you're that age, you just want to fit in. You don't want to be on any borderlands. You don't, you just, you just want to belong. And so I think every journey through the borderlands begins with that first stage, the struggle when you enter the borderlands. So how do we move from one stage to the other? How do you establish a life on the borderlands? I think TCKs will tell you the trick or the key is to, to accept your multifaceted identity, the idea that you are many things at the same time, many people, many places, many experiences, and to, to accept those differences as part of who you are. Um, and that to them is really, and to, to people like me that I had to realize was the key to establishing a life on the borderlands. And it took me years before I could see uh, things that I thought were weaknesses, these differences, but seeing them as strengths things that I could capitalize on, things that made me, me. But age 18, I still don't know that yet. Um, I've withdrawn so much inside myself, I flunked my national exams. I get drafted into the compulsory military service that all Singaporean males have to serve for two years. And it's in military that my officers realize that I can speak pretty well. Uh, so they make me what they call the master of ceremony, um, or MC, the person who goes up on stage and irritates people, welcomes them, makes life difficult for everyone sitting in the chairs. Um, and so they make me the MC for the base promotion events and any other events that they have. They give me training, and I do event after event, building up my confidence. I finish my army, and I think, hey, I'm actually pretty okay at this. And so I go back to school, I study something called mass communication, and I'm determined one day, one day I'm going to be a news presenter, I'm going to be an announcer on the radio. Um, I joined the campus radio station. I start getting gigs hosting or emceeing public events. Um, I graduate and I start my own company doing this, something that I love. Um, and I meet the most amazing people who see my potential and mentor me. I keep honing my craft. I get 
bigger and bigger gigs, larger and larger audiences. I go from a, a crowd of 100 to 1,000, 10,000. At the peak of my career, uh, I host to an audience of 40,000 people in the Singapore National Stadium. There's nothing quite like that, that thrill of making an announcement and just hearing that crowd roar. It just sends chills down your spine. It's like this completely different world. But something still didn't quite feel right. Something didn't feel at home for me. It was so strange because I had spent two thirds of my life in Singapore. I had celebrated my differences. I would even put a career around it. I built a career around it, but somehow I still didn't quite feel at home. It really made me think, maybe there was something more to it than just establishing my identity. Maybe there was a need to grow. And I guess that brings me to the final stage, at least for me, of being in the borderlands, and that's growing in the borderlands. I think looking back, uh, my time on the fringes of uh, cultures and communities on the borderlands itself just made me a lot more sensitive to other people who are struggling as well, struggling to fit in, people on the borderlands too. And so I'd been looking for a way to give back. So age 24, I'm, I'm longing for something meaningful to do with my skills in communication, but also art and trying to put those things together. So I end up volunteering at an art class for the most incredible people with uh, Down syndrome and other learning disabilities. And it's an art class that happens every Saturday on the weekend. Um, and I hear their own stories from their own borderlands of belonging. I remember one mom telling me a story of how when her son with Down syndrome sits down on a train, the person next to them looks at the son, gets up and moves off. And I, and I reach inside myself with my own experiences of being on the fringes, of being on the borderlands, and, and I can empathize with their, their sadness and their shame. And they don't once ask me about my accent, which is amazing. Um, and I feel so at home there. And I go for one session, I go for another session, and I keep going. And eventually they say, Josh, would you like to take over as a teacher? We hear you've got experience in art. And so I do that, and I end up teaching them for three years. And I see firsthand how art can give people a voice who don't always have one in society. And I see how art can really make a change for these people. And at the end of those three years, I say, yeah, this, this is what I want to do with my life. This is, this is what I want to do by using art to reach out to other people on the borderlands. So I know it's time, I know it's time to move on. So I pack my things, I close down my business, I take my life savings, and I move to the UK to pursue a postgraduate degree in art therapy. And so my journey through the borderlands begins again. I've come back again to the beginning, the stages of struggle, of establishing, and of growing. I think in my field of art therapy, one of the things I've really enjoyed is the concept of the mental health continuum. It's the idea that uh, we're not just well or unwell. Uh, there's a lot of space in between, a continuum, if you will, that we're constantly moving throughout the day. Something that makes us feel a bit more well, something that makes us feel a bit more unwell. And I think that's quite similar for belonging as well. Maybe it's not just about belonging and not belonging to a place or to a person. Maybe it's the borderlines of belonging in between that we're constantly moving throughout the course of our day, our months, our years. In, in each new group, we're going to be at different points on the borderlands of belong, different stages, whether it's struggling, established and growing, and we move from a new place to a new group, that's gonna change. And maybe we see a friendly smile in a strange place, or, um, we, we, and we move up the scale, or, or a colleague makes a remark that makes us feel a little bit uncomfortable and we feel like we don't belong as much in that workplace. We're constantly moving up and down during the course of our day. So, in conclusion, I just want to say that for those of you who are journeying through your own borderlands of belonging, I don't pretend to know what that is. It's important to know that you're not alone in that journey, that there are so many other people with you, but in their own individual journeys. Just know that these borderlands of belonging aren't as a bleak wasteland as we might think that they are, but they, they're rich with potential. Yes, I mean, sown with the seeds of struggle, but filled with the colorful lives of so many other people. So know that you will find your own place in your own time, in your own borderlands of belonging. Thank you.